thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was unexpected. Uh, yes, hello, um, I'm James, and I'm going to talk to you today about practical functional programming. I have to make sure I get through this uh, in plenty of time, and the clock's not ticking down, so I don't know how much time I've got. That's very confusing. Okay, so what do I mean by functional programming? Well, initially, I didn't even know. Um, I was casting around for ideas for stuff to talk about on Twitter a while ago, and Jan gave me this suggested title, Practical Functional Programming. And at the time, I just brushed that off with a silly joke. But it got me kind of thinking, as we talk about JavaScript a lot as a functional programming language, right? Because it has first class functions, and we have events and callbacks, and we have you know, all the array operations like map and filter and reduce and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot more to functional programming than we often acknowledge. Um, and what I would like to do is try to sort of demystify that a little bit. And um, because one criticism of functional programming that's often leveled is it's not very practical. It's this very academic thing, and you need a PhD to understand it. So what I'd like to do is sort of talk about the ways in which we are already using some functional ideas in, in mainstream JavaScript and talk about how we could pay better attention to those and get more value out of them, if that makes sense. I also promise this is the last occurrence of the word monad in this talk, so don't worry. There's not going to be a lot of type theory stuff going on. So what do we mean by functions? Well, functional programming is all about programming without side effects. If you're in the um, parallel JavaScript talk earlier, uh, you will have heard that side effects are one of the biggest barriers to parallelizing a program because you can't reason about uh, changes to global state that have to happen in a certain order. That makes it very hard to parallelize things. So what does it look like to program functionally? So let's look at a couple of examples. Say you want to calculate the length of a list, right? So length uh, takes a, um, a list of uh, list and returns an int. That's what that little type signature thing means I borrowed from Haskell. So what you could do is set a counter to zero and then increment the counter for every element that you see in the list and then return the last value of the counter. So how does that run out in practice? So we want to get the value of this list. We set the counter to zero. There's a first element, so we increment the index. There's a second element, so we increment the index. There's a third element, so we increment the index. But there's no fourth element, so then we break the loop, and index is three. And here I've written uh, these uh, values of the index in comments, because those aren't statements that appear anywhere actually in the program. That state that you have to keep in your head while you're figuring out what the program does, and that's what makes imperative programs hard to reason about. A functional version would look like this. So CoffeeScript has this uh, three dots syntax that lets you break a list into its first element and the rest of its elements. So here we're saying, if the first element is undefined, the list, the length, the list is empty, right? so it has length 0. Otherwise, the length is 1 plus the length of the rest of the list. So we're doing this recursive breakdown. What does that look like in practice? So there is a first element, so we'll pick the second branch of the conditional, and we're just going to replace that expression with its definition from the function. We're using the function as a rewrite rule. There's no uh, implicit state to, take, to keep track of. We do that a couple more times, and then we get length of the empty list, which then we pick the first uh, branch of the conditional, which is 0, and then the result falls out. So here, rather than writing comments with state in them, I've written um, is before each expression. And that's because all of these expressions are identical. That doesn't mean that they happen to have the same value at some particular point in time. It means they always have the same value. You can replace one of these expressions with any of the others, and your program will do exactly the same thing. So being able to reason about your program by just substituting bits of source code for one another makes things easy to think about, because you don't have to sort of track state off somewhere else in your mind or on paper to figure out what's going on. Let's take another function, map. So map, the signature means map takes a function from A to B and a list of A's and returns a list of B's. So the imperative version of that would be to make an empty list and then push f of x onto that list for every element in the input and then return the list. The functional version would be to say that if there is no first element, if x is undefined, then return an empty list. Otherwise, apply f to the first element and then combine that with map over the rest of the list. It's the same structure as what we're doing with length. We're just using lists instead of numbers. So in practice, say if we want to square the first three numbers, uh, we go, OK, well, there is a first element, so we'll take the second branch. So square of 1 is 1. We pull that out of the front, and then we map over what's left. We do that a couple more times to square 2 and then to square 3. And now we have map of an empty list, which the function tells us is an empty list. And so the result falls out. So these are our functional solutions to the problem. They work not by mutating state. They work by just giving you an expression for what you're trying to calculate that you can replace, and you do that recursively. 
Uh, and you can program by substitution by, by using these things. The imperative solutions work by making some state and then like changing that state until some condition becomes true and then handing that state off to you at the end. But even though these have internal state and they're not internally functional, from the caller's point of view, they do exactly the same thing as these versions. Because they don't mutate any of their inputs, they don't mutate any of the uh, results that come out of them, and they also don't mutate any other global state. So you can treat them as though they were pure functions. Now that's really useful because it means that their state is completely encapsulated, so uh, their side effects don't leak out into the rest of the program. There's a place that we use that all the time in modern JavaScript, which is promises. Promises have internal state, right? They are pending and then they can become fulfilled or rejected with a value or an error. But every time you call then, it will yield the same value to you, right? You never get to see what's actually going on inside of the promise. You just call then and a value pops out and it's always the same value. And that means you can treat a promise as an immutable value, which is really useful. So a couple of weeks ago, Tom Ashworth had this really good essay where he says that um, events are a bad primitive for data flow. They require distribution of mutable state around your code, and it's not idiomatic or pleasant to flow data through events. So what does he mean by that? Why do events require distribution of mutable state? We can use types to answer that question. So if we consider the fs.read file function from Node, that takes a path name and an encoding and a callback, and it returns nothing. And the callback is itself a function that takes an error and a value and also returns nothing. Now, a function that returns nothing must have side effects, because if a function has no return value and no side effects, why are you calling it? It doesn't do anything. Right? So this thing that you think of as not having side effects, just reading a file, we actually work with these things completely using side effecty functions. And uh, when we're dealing with all these asynchronous things happening all the time, we have to make sure those side effects happen in the right order so that our program doesn't get into a bizarre state. And trying to do that on concurrent programs is very, very, very difficult, as you no doubt know. It gets even harder when you try to do a lot of things at the same time. So, so if you want to read a file and you want to request a URL and you want to get something out of a database all at the same time, that's fine. You can use async.parallel to do that. And then uh, they go and do all those operations. And then when they all complete, you get a callback. And it gives you all the values of those things. Now, what would I do if I wanted to get the value of the file before the other things have completed and do something with it? Because this, if any of the things fail, I won't get any of the values. But so I want to work on the file even if the HTTP request fails. Well, I could pull the file operation out up top. So I go fs.read file, do something with that, and then do the async parallel things for the other bits. But now I've made the program slower, right? Because the second things are blocked on the first thing completing. So I've deparallelized it. Uh, so that kills the performance, right, if you do that a lot. It's, more, it's kind of convenient, but you've traded convenience for performance. What you actually have to do is keep the parallel construct to make sure all the I.O. happens at the same time, but then poke your processing into the bit where the file is requested. And the more you interleave these things, your data access and your data processing, which you're forced to do by the way that we, do, by the way that we schedule things in asynchronous programs, your programs get very messy and tangled. You get into what we call callback hell. And callback hell is not really a syntactic thing about your code creeping across the page. It's really the inability to reason about when things are happening in your program and make sure they happen as efficiently as possible. Because to do this, you have to construct your program in a very specific way with callbacks in all the right places. So last year, I wrote this article called Callbacks are Imperative, Promises are Functional, which opened with this quote. The nature of promises is that they remain immune to changing circumstances. Now, I've already mentioned that. <laughs> hey, got some laughs. Um, I've already mentioned how promises kind of look like immutable values because then always gives you the same result out once the task is completed. But this is also true in a second way that I didn't realize at the time, and that's that promises let you deal with changing program requirements much more easily. So let's look at an example about that. Before, when I was using the async module, I had to change my program quite. Um, radically, I had to make a big structural change to it to make a, quite a small requirement change. But say if those functions return promises, right? My fs.read file and http.get and database.get all return promises of strings. Well, then I can call all those functions, and I can put the results in an array, and all the I.O. will just happen in parallel. Uh, but now I've got an array of promises of strings. And if I want just the first, if I just want the file out of that, then I can get the first promise out of the list and call then on it and do something with the result. If I want to wait for all of the things to finish, then I can call promise.all with the documents, and then I'll get a promise that will give me all of the results when they're ready. 
If I don't want to do deal with the file on its own, I just delete the documents.0 line. Or if I want to deal with the other arguments on their own, I can just add lines to deal with those. I don't have to make big structural changes to my program. So the, uh, the, the, uh, you, you keep the ability to keep your I.O. happening in parallel, but you keep the convenience of being able to work with it easily. And that's really important for dealing with programs that change a lot over time. Uh, and the reason this works is that I can ask for the value out of the file promise, and promise.all can also ask for the value out of that file promise, and, um, and it'll work both times, because you can keep asking for the value out of a promise over and over again, and you won't repeat any work. That's what, what it means to be immutable. It's reusable, right? So let's talk about what then actually does. Right? We talk about it in very imperative terms. We say things like, well, then it takes a function, and that function will be invoked when the task completes with the value of the task. Or if the task is already completed, it will be invoked with the value of the task. And it returns a promise, and that promise will be invoked with the return of the callback. We talk about even the name, right, then. It's about do this, and then do that, and then do that. But if we think about the types of things that are involved, what then really does is it takes a promise of A and a function from A to B and returns a promise of B, right? So if we have a promise of a string and we call then with a function that counts the words in the string, right, string.split on spaces.length, what we get is a promise of an int. Um, we might not have the int yet, but that's the type of that value that we have. And we can continue to do, do more processing on it, transform it into another thing, transform it into another thing, um, and just use the promise itself as a value, not the thing that's inside of it. This is exactly the same as array, the way array.map works, right? Array.map takes a list of something and a function from A to B and returns a list of B, right? So if you have a list of strings and you map a word counting function over the list, you now have a list of word counts, just as if you call then with the word counting function, you turn a promise of a string into a promise of a word count. A promise is just a container. It's just a list. They're the same thing. These operations are exactly the same thing. It's take a, one, a container of one type to a con same container of the other type with a mapping function between them. And because they're just containers, you can compose containers, right? They're just a t another type of data structure. So if you have a list of promises of strings, you can turn that into a list of promises of ints by mapping over the array and then thenning over the promises inside. And this is no different from mapping over a nested array, right? You just have two maps inside of one another. Promise.all is the same. We talk about promise.all as in you give it a bunch of promises as input, and then it will give you one promise that will resolve when all of those promises resolve. We talk about it in time terms. But if we talk about it in type terms, what it actually does is it turns a container inside out. You give it a list of promises, and it gives you a promise of a list. You get one promise back that will give you a list of all of the things. This also solves the Zalgo problem, right? Zalgo is Isaac Schluter's pers personification of the problem with writing callback APIs that will execute a callback synchronously or asynchronously. So if you write code that says data equals null, promise.then x data equals x, and then process the data, you're assuming that the callback on line two executes before the statement on line three, otherwise your program won't work. If that callback ran asynchronously, your program would break. But the only reason this is a problem is because you have side effects, right? You care about things happening in a certain order. Something has been changed into another state before another statement runs. If instead you do your process inside of the promise construct, you don't think of a promise as a thing to get a value out of. You think of it as a value on its own that you can do computation inside of. Then that problem goes away. So I want to talk about laziness. That's another big topic in functional programming. And it's a core feature of the Haskell language. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of Haskell code. Um, but the main difference is the, the uh, three dots syntax from CoffeeScript uh, in Haskell is written as a colon. So that's the first element, colon, the rest of the elements. So map we've already seen. Map of an empty list is an empty list. And map in the general case is you apply f to x and combine that with map over the rest of the list. It looks a bit weird, but we saw this working earlier in CoffeeScript. Filter works pretty much the same way. Filter of an empty list is an empty list. And filter in the case where p of x is true means you keep x, and then you combine that with the filter of the rest of the list. Otherwise, you throw x away, and you filter the rest of the list. So we're keeping or throwing away x based on whether the predicate is true for that value. We also have a function called take, which gives you the first n elements of a list. So take where n is less than 0 is an empty list, because you don't want to take any more data. Take of an empty list is also an empty list, because there's no more data to take. And then in the general case, uh, take means that you pop the first element off the list and then take n minus 1 of what's left. And you're, if you apply that recursively, you can see the value will fall out. And this lets you do something very, very powerful. So Haskell has infinite data structures. Um, one dot dot 
is the list one, two, three, four, five, off to infinity. In JavaScript, if you try to filter that, the filter would never return. It would never reach the end, because it tries to process the whole array at once. But look what happens in Haskell. I'm just going to program by replacing function calls with their definitions, and we'll see what happens. So even if one is false, so we drop the one. Even if two is true, so we pull the two out front and filter over what's left. Now we've destructured the operand to map, so we can pull that two through the squaring function. Now we've destructured the operand to take, so we can pull that expression out front and then take three minus one of what's left, leaving us with take two. So we've pulled one value through the list all the way through the pipeline. We do that one more time. We come down to take one. And then one more time again, we come down to take zero. And we've got three elements out front. And we know that by definition, take of zero is an empty list. And then the result pops out. And we didn't have to look at the rest of the infinite list. We don't have to care about it. That's really, really powerful. So it's skipping work you don't need to do in order to get the result you want. Again, Tom Ashworth saw, uh, summed this up very, very nicely when he says, there are two ways to combine these transformations. You can perform the first transformation on the whole collection before moving on to the second, or you can perform all the transformations on the first element of the collection before moving on to the second. Now, the first version is how JavaScript deals with arrays, right? You filter the whole array, and then you hand that off to the map, and the map maps over the whole array. So you iterate it over for as many operations as you have. The second way is how Haskell deals with arrays. So these two processing models shows you that there's nothing inherent about the data structure that means that you have to process them in this way. You can use either strategy. And just as Haskell deals with lists as though they were streams, we can deal with streams as though they were lists. So streams, they're a big part of node programming, right? Huge part of node programming. It's really node's core feature is streams. So I'm going to do something a little uh, funky. So I'm going to make a class called map that inherits from stream.transform. And its constructor is going to take a function, and its transform method is going to apply that function to every incoming chunk and then push it. And I'm going to add a map method to stream.prototype uh, that simply pipes the stream through this map transform. And again, notice the similarity to array.map and uh, promise.then. We're taking a stream of A's and a function from A to B and getting a stream of B's. It's exactly the same operation. Filter works the same way. You instantiate it with a uh, predicate function. And now we're going to push the chunk if the predicate is true for that chunk. Take is going to be instantiated with a number. And in the transform method, we're going to push the chunk if n is greater than 0. And then we're going to decrement n. And then we're going to call end if n reaches 0. And what that end will do is it will mean that all the streams that are feeding into this uh, will stop sending it data, because it's emitted end. It doesn't want any more data. So once we've got the information that we want, we can stop processing. That gets us laziness. One little bit more of syntactic sugar. We've got split, um, with the split module. So I'm going to add that to stream.prototype. And I'm also going to set high watermark 0 on all of these streams, because that means that Node won't eagerly buffer data that the streams don't need. The streams will pull data through as they need it. So say I've put all this code, all these streams, in a file called lazy.coffee. I can create a read stream from that, and I can split that on line breaks, and I can filter those lines for class definitions, and then I can map those matches to uppercase, and I can take one of them. And if I attach a data listener to that, then I will get the first class definition that comes out as uppercase. And if you watch the, um, the filter and the map functions here, they'll only be called as many times as necessary to produce the output. This program won't consume the whole file. That's quite powerful, right? You're sort of letting the consumer of this operation dictate how much it gets read at the far end. So you're avoiding work you don't need to do. So here we're programming the streams, and they look like arrays. And this might look like a cute trick, but this is actually a, a general model of programming called functional reactive programming. So for the final example, I'm going to write an IRC client using this strategy. But first, I'm going to write it imperatively, so it's in a more familiar form. So an IRC client is going to take a TCP socket, stand it in, stand it out, and a log file. We're going to split the TCP input on line breaks, as IRC is a line-oriented protocol. We're going to write that, file, that line to the logs. We're going to parse the line into an IRC command structure. And if the uh, command is a notice, we'll print it to the screen. So all this client will do is it will receive notices from the server, and it will print them. So the user also wants to join rooms. So we're going to split standard input on line breaks. And if we see a line beginning slash join, then we set our global variable room to the value of that regex match. And then we construct an IRC command that's uh, the, the IRC command for joining that room. 
if we did manage to construct a, a command, then we'll unparse it, turn it into a string, and then we'll write that string to both the TCP socket and we'll write it to the logs. We also want to send messages. So if we're in a room and the line is not blank, then we'll construct a priv message command, which is IRC speak for sending a message somewhere, with the room and the line of input. That's the room that we're currently in. So we always send a message to the room that we're currently in. And then finally, we want to receive messages from the server. So if we get a priv message from the server, we will get the channel and the message out of that command and then compare the channel to the room that we're currently in. And if they match, then we'll display the line. Right, so we're only going to display messages from the server for the room that we're currently in rather than for all the rooms that we've joined. So here there's a lot of um, there's state, there's what room we're in, there's conditional processing, there's a lot of side effects, things are being written to, we've got event listeners. Uh, this is the imperative style of solving this problem. Programs like this tend to not scale very well because the bigger they get, the harder it is to reason about what is happening at which times, which is important because you've written it in a stateful way. So to write that functionally, we could write a function that takes a TCP input stream and a user input stream and returns synchronously a TCP output stream and a user output stream and some logs. So rather than taking all of this as input and returning nothing and using side effects, we take the inputs and we return the outputs. And we're going to do this without using callbacks. So how's that going to work? So firstly, we're going to say IRC in equals TCP dot map IRC parse. So we're taking a stream of strings and mapping them through a parsing function, and that gives us a stream of IRC command objects. This is just like working with arrays, right? Just pretend you're using arrays, because that's really what's going to happen. Then to get the notices, we can filter those commands for ones whose command is notice, and then map those matches through a formatting function, and then simply assign those notices to user out here. And that means user out will be the formatted notice commands from the TCP stream. And then for the logs, we're just going to say that logs are the TCP input mapped through some formatting function. Now, we want to join rooms, right? So let's add some more code. So we're going to say rooms is the user input mapped through a function that does a regex match on each line of input. So it's going to match slash join with a room name. And we're going to filter those regex matches for ones that aren't null, so we just get the lines that actually matched. And we're going to map those matches uh, just to pull the room value out of the regex match. Now we've got a stream of rooms that we've joined. To tell the server about that, we need to produce a stream of join commands. So we can just say rooms.map, join command equals rooms.map uh, to produce an IRC command. And then to send those to the server, we can just say tcp out equals join command.map IRC unparsed. So we're taking this stream of join, uh, join commands here, mapping them to strings, and assigning that to the TCP output. I'm also merging the TCP output into the logs here. So I'm taking stuff from the inputs and stuff from the outputs and combining them in a really clean way to get my logs, instead of uh, putting logging logic like at lots of different points in the program as we had before. Now, we want to be able to send messages. So to send a message, you need the room you're currently in and you need the message you want to send. But we're trying to do this without state, so there's no global room variable. So instead, what we do is we say messages is user in dot filter uh, for lines that aren't blank, essentially. And then we do this thing, rooms.sampled by. And what that does is whenever messages emits an event, it gets the latest event emitted by rooms, and then it gives you both of those values as function arguments, and then you can construct an IRC command out of them. So that gives you a stream of IRC commands for all the messages you want to send. And then we can just merge those into the TCP output with the joins that we were sending earlier. So finally, we want to be able to receive no, uh, messages from other people. So we're going to filter the incoming messages for ones that match a uh, priv message. That's what's going on uh, here. And then again, we're going to use sampled by. Uh, so every time we get a message in, we're going to be given the room we're currently in and the message that we just got. And I'm going to compare the room we're currently in to the messages room parameter. So this gives us a stream of Booleans that tells us whether the message that we just got is for the room that we're currently in, if that makes sense. It's a slightly weird operation, but it does work. And then I can filter the incoming messages on that Boolean stream, right? So if you have a stream of Booleans, you can use that to filter a stream of something else. Um, so this will give me a stream of the incoming messages that are for the room that I'm currently in. So now I've written a non-trivial network application that does exactly the same as what we had before, but it has no side effects, like no variables are mutated here. It has no callbacks in the sense of 
um, side effecty functions that return nothing. It's all pure functions. You can replace any variable in this program with its definition, and the program will do exactly the same thing, which means there's no hidden state to take care of. And rather than writing a program that says do this, and then do this, and then do this, you've written a program that defines streams of data in terms of other streams of data and made all the control flow implicit. That makes it much easier to write concurrent programs. So to sum up, you can get the slides here at slides.jcogman.com. The article that Tom Ashworth wrote is a link from there. Uh, a while ago, Anand Prasad wrote a really good article about the uh, similarities between promises and lists and maybes and stuff like that and how they compose. Um, last year, Philip Roberts, who's giving a talk here tomorrow, wrote, uh, gave a really good talk at real-time conf about functional reactive programming that you need to watch. And then um, I've ended that with the uh, links to documentation for some of these streaming libraries that I've been using in this talk. Um, and finally, uh, I thought I'd try and do something nice while I'm here. Uh, earlier this year, I wrote this book. Um, apparently, it's quite good. If you use the, the voucher code JS Fest for this weekend, you can get five pounds off of it, and it's already half price. So thank you very much for having me, and I will see you upstairs. <laughs>